Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Attitudes. Father, we thank you for the word tonight. We pray that it will make a dynamic impact in people's lives. Now, you know, there's thousands of attitudes, good attitudes, bad attitudes, and so. Let me just say a few things to you about attitude. Your attitude is yours. Nobody can make you have a good one, and nobody can make you have a bad one. And unless you believe that, you'll never get to first base. Because one of the biggest problems that we have in our lives is not taking responsibility for ourselves and our behavior. We love to make excuses. We like to blame. It's always because of this, because of that. But the truth of the matter is, and please hear me, God never tells us to do anything that he doesn't give us the ability to do it. How many of you can at least believe that? It would be pretty ridiculous for God to say, walk in love, but ha ha, you can't. <laughs> Forgive your enemies, but ha ha, you can never do it because it's just too hard. And the Bible talks about attitude. This is not just a today word. The Bible says a lot about attitude, and your attitude makes a difference in how you approach all of life. Two different men were looking through prison bars. One saw mud and one saw stars. It's up to you. You've heard the things, you know, take your lemons and make lemonade. You know, some people, their glass is always half full and some it's always half empty. You know, it just, it's, it's your outlook. It's how you decide to view things. The happiest people don't necessarily have the best of everything, but they make the best of everything. And you can change tonight. Maybe you've been a bad attitude person all your life, but I'm telling you that you can make a decision in this place tonight that from now on, I am going to learn to have a good attitude. Because I can tell you the truth, having a bad attitude toward anything or anybody never, ever, ever makes the situation any better. So having a bad attitude is just a waste of time. It doesn't help you. It doesn't change your circumstance. All it does is make you bitter and unhappy. And I have discovered that when people are bitter and unhappy, they make a full-time job out of trying to make everybody around them bitter and unhappy. <laughs> so get happy and let people enjoy you. Amen? Amen? Be positive. Expect the best of everything. I challenge you to take 30 days, the next 30 days, and expect the best. Expect the best parking place. Expect the best seat in a restaurant. If you don't get it, don't have a bad attitude. <laughs> expect favor everywhere that you go. Expect the best treatment from the clerks that you deal with out in the marketplace. Expect good news. I love good news. I tell you what, I get fed up with bad news. And so I make it a habit every morning in my prayer, I say, God, I'm expecting good news today. I'm expecting favor. What are you expecting in your life? Well, I don't know. Just kind of waiting to see what happens. <laughs> I mean, that's the way we are a lot of times. It's like we're not really releasing our faith for anything. Waiting on God means to be full of expectation, expecting God to do something great in your life. I just, I just expect God to really show out here in Phoenix this weekend, amen? I think we got a good start with that amazing number of people who stood to get their life right with Christ. Wow, what a good beginning. So take the next 30 days and expect the best and you'll see how just having an attitude of expecting the best will open new doors for good things in your life. And you know, maybe you've had a lot of bad things happen to you and you've just gotten in the habit of kind of expecting the worst because you think, well, you know, I don't want to expect the best and be disappointed. 
But you see, then you're just playing right into the devil's hands if you do that. And not only that, also when you expect the best, make a decision that you're going to do your best at everything. You're going to give your best and do your best. Your attitude makes a difference in how you face every challenge in life. And I can tell you, you are going to have challenges. I doubt very much that there will be a week that will go by in any one of our lives that we won't have some kind of a challenge. It may be a minor thing like heavy traffic that frustrates us. And it could be a major thing like getting some kind of news that you just were not expecting at all. I had something like that happen last week. And I'll tell you a little bit more about it as I get into my message, but I was tired. I sat down in my chair to relax. I noticed that little red thing beeping on my phone. Sometimes you just got to stay away from that thing. <laughs> I thought, okay, well, I'll look at these messages. And man, I got one I did not like. It just flat out made me mad. There it is. You got to deal with it. What can you do? How many of you know we get things to deal with that we weren't expecting, don't want, and don't know how to get rid of? So... First thing you got to do when something like that happens, the very first thing you have to do is decide what kind of an attitude you're going to have toward it. As I'm going to share a scripture with you that I know that you know, but I may repeat this scripture 10, 15 times this weekend. All things work together for good. <laughs> it may not feel good. The thing may not even be good, but God is good. And God can take anything and work it out for your good. You can grow from having to deal with it. You can learn something that will help you in the future. All things work together for good to those who love God and want His will in their life. Those who love God and are called according to His purpose. And that's something that we practice in our household. And after I got that phone text thing, it wasn't very long, and I was saying, okay, God, all things work out for good to those who love you and are called according to your purpose. And I want you to begin to really believe that, because I think that's a biblical attitude that God wants us to have. I don't like this. I don't want this. It doesn't feel good right now. But you know, either God is God or He isn't. And either He is greater than our circumstances or He's not. But we can't sit passively by and just kind of wait to see what God's going to do. Christianity is not a passive religion. We need to release our faith by opening our mouth and speaking something that's going to give the angels something to work with. The Bible says that angels hearken to the Word of God. They do not hearken to our complaining and murmuring and grumbling, but they hearken to the Word of God. So the first problem you get, everything wants to sink that you can get hold of yourself and say, this is going to work out good. God says that everything will work out good if I keep loving Him, keep praying over it, and want His will in my life. Somebody say amen. amen. Your attitude is an inward feeling that always wiggles its way out. How many of you know if you've got an attitude, a hard attitude about something, it won't be long, and it's going to show up somewhere. Where did you get your attitude? Why do some people just seem to have a much better one just kind of naturally than other people? Well, it does have something to do with your personality. My natural personality is, is more deeper, and, you know, I'm a, a fixer and, a, and a, a rescuer, and so I have a tendency to see what's wrong so I can fix it and make it right. You know, Dave's personality is more easygoing and laid back, and he don't look for nothing to fix because he don't want to fix it anyway. He'd rather just <laughs> trust God and let God fix it. Amen? And you know, that, that he's, that's, it's great. We make a good team. I'm always running out ahead, and he's saying, we'll see what God does, and it works good. We do good together. When I get all in a dither, he says, all things are going to work out good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And God usually puts two people together that aren't alike because you need each other. So just stop having a fit about the person that you're married to not being like you. You better get happy they're not like you. So your personality, which is your God-given temperament, 
And then a few years of situations from the world, kind of you end up with a personality. But here's the thing. We have strengths. There's things in all of our personalities that are good things, really good things. But we've also all got weaknesses. All right. Me leaning a little bit more toward the negative would be a weakness. But God promises us that he will show himself strong in our weaknesses. So even though I might have to try a little harder than Dave does to be positive, I can still do it. See, Dave said all things work together for good quicker than I did. I mean, it only took him two. He's like, oh, don't worry about it. It'll work out good. And I'm like, well, somebody's got to do something about it. And who's that going to be? How <laughs> I many of you know what I'm talking about? It's like, well, that sounds good, but now I've got to deal with this mess, you know. So it took me maybe 15 minutes to get to where he was right away. But the good news is, is 15 years ago, I never got there. And then finally I could get there after a few weeks and then a few days and now it only takes maybe 10 or 15 minutes. So don't use your personality as an excuse. Don't look at it and say, well, it's, it's, it's easy for you. It's just not easy for me. <laughs> well, you know what? The Holy Spirit is not in our lives so we can have everything easy. There are things that are difficult, but he will help us do them. Your environment. Different things that happen to you growing up can affect your attitude, but don't use it as an excuse. How other people treated you. My dad taught me to be negative. He actually taught me, don't trust anybody because everybody's out to get you. Well, it took me a long time to overcome that. He actually programmed a bad negative attitude into me. How you see yourself affects your attitude and all of your actions toward other people. A lot of years of my life, I didn't like me because I had a shame-based nature from being abused. Well, when you don't like yourself, then everything that comes out of you has got some kind of poison in it. What you think affects your attitude. The way you think about your neighbor becomes your attitude toward your neighbor. Your whole posture toward your neighbor. If you sit in your house and you think, that guy, no more needs that new car he got. <laughs> he can't even pay the bills he's got now. <laughs> I can promise you that inner attitude will wiggle its way out when you see him. And something in your body language or your voice tone or the way you talk to him will let him know that you don't approve of him. <laughs> got to be very careful how you sit in your home and think about things because it'll wiggle out. Well, I can't help the way I think. Yes, you can. <laughs> the way you think about yourself is a major thing in your life. If you think too much about your faults, now listen to what I'm going to say. If you think too much about your faults, you're going to disrespect yourself. You're going to lack confidence and you're going to set up a pattern of failure in your own life. Now, we're going to talk about four different attitudes this weekend. Tonight, I want to talk about having a forgiving and a merciful attitude. Does that sound like anything that anybody needs? A merciful and a... You're like, oh, forgiveness. I know that message. <laughs> yeah, well, then why aren't you doing it? I think we're educated way beyond our level of obedience. How many more Bible studies will it take? before you're no longer touchy and easily offended and go around with your feelings hurt half the time. Well, I know that. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Well, when's the last time you went to bed mad? <laughs> See, we don't know it until we're doing it. Amen? But I want to lean a lot tonight toward the subject of mercy. So first, I just want to show you what your choices are. If I could have my little helpers come. Come on out. Hold your sign up. Wrong, you got the, that's the wrong group. <laughs> but I'm going to be merciful toward the people that I told seven times how to do this. <laughs> Is, isn't it a good thing I'm teaching on mercy tonight? <laughs> do you have the right one now? 
She has no other ones now. Okay, well, one of our attitudes later this weekend is patience, so I guess I better stop. <laughs> guess I better start working on that one too now. What's the one she's looking for? Mercy and unforgiveness. Is she going, going, gone? Here she comes. Okay. Yay! All right, there you go. See, it worked out good. We got a lesson while we were learning. Okay, so your choices are to be merciful and forgiving or you. <laughs> Everybody. Everybody all at once are to be resentful, discontent, complaining. You even look the part there, Phil. <laughs> but you sing good, so it's okay. And negative. Now, look at this. You got a choice. Every one of you, everyone watching by television, you think I don't know you're out there? We're not ignoring you just because you're there behind that tube and think you're safe. Actually, the reason I do this is for you, you beautiful people watching by TV. Amen? So, you have a choice. You can either learn to be merciful and forgiving, or you can continue to be negative, complaining, discontent, and resentful. How many of you are smart enough to know which one to choose? All right. You guys can go away for right now. Don't lose your signs, though. Let's look first at Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let the same attitude and purpose. Everybody say attitude. attitude. Your attitude is yours. Come on, I want you to get that. Your attitude belongs to you. Nobody can make you have a good one. Nobody can make you have a bad one. Say, my attitude belongs to me. I can have a bad one or a good one. It's totally up to me. Let this same attitude and purpose and humble mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Let him be your example in humility. Now, I believe that humility, having a, a humble attitude, has to be the foundation for every other good attitude. I don't really think we can develop any other good attitude if we've not let God work with us to develop humility. The word humility means to be low-lying or to remain under, to remain under God's mighty hand, to remain under the Word of God. So in other words, if somebody hurts me, and I'd really like to stay mad at them, but I know the Word of God tells me to forgive them, then I can't do that unless I first humble myself under the hand of God. If you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, in due time, He will exalt you. I can promise you that some of you have no idea at all how many blessings you're missing in your life by staying bitter and resentful and angry and being touchy and getting mad every time you turn around. Amen. When God tells us to forgive, He's not asking us to do anything for somebody else. He tells us to do it so we can be happy, so we can be joyful, so we can take our hands off of trying to get everybody else, everybody back and let God do what only God can do. God promises that He will bring justice in our life and make things right, but He won't do it as long as we keep trying to do His work for Him. Amen? Amen. You may get 50 opportunities in a month to practice this message. You don't have to wait very long, and somebody will do something <laughs> that's going to aggravate you, hurt you, make you mad, and you can choose. I'm either going to be merciful or I'm going to be harsh and hard and have a bitter attitude toward them. 
But you have to start with humility. Nothing else works without humility. How does a person develop humility? I think it only comes from brokenness. Brokenness sounds like a bad word, but it's actually a beautiful word. You know what it means? It means that you let God deal with you until the stubbornness in your life is gone. And I think brokenness only comes from really meeting ourselves and seeing ourselves how we really are and realizing how much mercy God gives us every single solitary day of our lives. His mercy endures forever. His mercy endures forever. How many times every day do you think that God has to give you mercy? How about you guys watching at home by TV? How, how many times a week do you think God has to give you mercy? I'll tell you the truth. God's mercy is flowing toward us constantly. All the time. All the time. All the time. We don't even begin to realize how far we are away from God's perfection and God's holiness. We sin in thought, word, and deed all the time. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. But now listen. Everything that God gives us, you don't want to miss this. This is big. Everything that God gives us, He expects us to let it flow through us to someone else. Amen. Everything about God is to you and through you. He doesn't want you to become a reservoir, a collection station of blessings where you can just sit around and be blessed and join the Christian Bless Me Club. In the very beginning of the Bible, he told Abram, if you will follow me, if you will leave all and follow me, I will bless you and I will make you a blessing, causing you to dispense good to others. Mercy. God, I pray that you'd give me the ability to get this across. Mercy is probably one of the most beautiful things in the whole world. Amen. Mercy is just absolutely beautiful. It cannot be earned. It cannot be deserved. Mercy is a gift. And it takes character, godly character, to be a person of mercy. Anybody can be harsh and hard and snippy and snappy and get mad every time they don't get their own way. We don't need the power of the Holy Ghost. We don't need the blood of Jesus for that. But I tell you what, when the world had 18 years with me. I mean, I had a very harsh, hard, bitter, resentful, manipulative, controlling, rebellious attitude. I mean, I had enough attitude to go around. And it took a lot of God dealing with me and a lot of word and a lot of brokenness for me to get to the point where I realized that God was not happy with my harsh, hard, bitter, quick to be angry, hard to forgive people attitude. He wants us to be merciful. He wants us to put on Christ. He wants us to put on love. The Bible says in Colossians, put on bowels of mercy. You put it on. Just like you put on your clothes before you came here tonight. They didn't just jump off the rack and jump on your body. You had to put them on. It's a thing we do on purpose. You don't even have to feel merciful to be merciful. Amen. You don't have to feel it. You can be merciful because it's about what you choose to do. You can help somebody who in the natural does not deserve your help at all. You can help somebody that has treated you terribly, and there's no reason at all for you to help them. But when you do, when you do show people mercy who don't deserve it, that's when you're showing yourself to be like God. That's when we show ourselves to be like God. That's when we can say, I know God. Amen? How many of you think you have a little ways to go in this area? I believe I do. Amen.
You know, really, no matter how we may feel about something, maybe somebody's hurt us and we feel like getting them back. The Bible says in Matthew 9, 13, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And, you know, if someone's mistreating you and maybe they've got some sinful behavior in their life, one of the ways that we can help bring them to repentance is by showing them the mercy of God. Now, that doesn't mean that you just let everybody walk all over you and you become a doormat for whatever. But one thing is for sure, we cannot be led around by our feelings and our emotions and ever really do the will of God. And I know that you probably do have problems with your emotions because most people do. And you probably need to learn more about how to forgive people and how to detect unforgiveness in your own life because most of us do.